Kurt Tatara, who will speak about classifying spaces in motivic homotopy theory. So please. Okay, thank you. Um, right, so let's see. Uh, the the uh, topic is uh, about specifically the, the uh, Chow ring of the classifying space of an algebraic group. Um, and, um, uh, but, but today I mostly want to uh, focus on um, explaining the general properties of Chow groups. Chow groups are um, kind of an analog of ordinary cohomology for algebraic varieties over any field. Um, and they have the interest that they're, they're generated specifically by algebraic subvarieties. So um, they're sort of analogous to ordinary cohomology, but they have the interest that they're telling you directly about algebraic subvarieties, which in some sense is about the difference between algebraic geometry and topology. <coughs> um, okay, so uh, let's see. So as I say, today I'll mostly talk about what are Chow groups but, um, and what properties they have quickly. Uh, with, with the aim of uh, uh, <laughs> preparing people a bit for the problem session uh, right after this, I think. Um, but uh, let's see. So maybe I, I'll start with some, uh, you know, advertisement for where we're going, like what this, what the classifying space uh, is like. Okay. So uh, let's see. So quick <laughs> uh, intro to the classifying space of an algebraic group. Um, so this was. Um, I'd say introduced by me and uh, Burrell and Vyvotsky in around uh, 1990, um, sort of published in 1999, um, and uh, yeah, worked out a few years before then. Um, so the um, setup briefly is you take um, an affine um, group scheme, finite type over field. Um, so I will mostly <laughs> describe what that means by a few examples. Um, so, um, let's see. Okay, so uh, what does that mean? So um, let's say in general, and then what is an affine group scheme of finite type over field? That's to say that um, G, you know, I mean, let's say any scheme of finite type over field, um, sort of affine, Finite type. What does that mean? That means that um, X is the the closed uh, subscheme of um, affine space given by some collection of polynomial equations. Um, um, right. So, uh, or sort of formally. So see, these these are some um, uh, just polynomials in n variables. Um, so yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, for any field, you could consider the set of, uh, you know, n tuples of points in K that satisfy a given bunch of polynomial equations. That's basically the definition of an algebra algebraic set or algebraic variety. Um, let's see. In, in scheme theory, uh, you formulate things a little bit differently, you know, because you want to be able to talk about not only this, you want the, the scheme X to sort of know what are the solutions of these equations, not only in the field K, but in every extension field of K or even every commutative ring that contains K. Um, anyway, uh, let's see, so, and then a group scheme is just, uh, it's an affine scheme where in addition you have um, a morphism that represents multiplication <coughs> from over K from, from G times G to G, and this should satisfy the usual axioms um, for a group. Uh, yeah, okay, so, and then what are the examples, sorry? Uh, okay. um, so, this, I'm sorry. Okay. Key examples are, um, so number one, you could take G to be a finite group, um, and then just um, viewed in a sort of trivial way as a um, scheme over K. Um, by the way, I guess another notation for this algebraic set would be to say that this is um, spec of the, of the commutative ring, K of X1 through Xn, divided by the ideal generated by these um, given polynomials. Um, so yeah, spec is this general uh, definition that turns a commutative ring into a topological space with a sheaf of rings um, as a space as the set of prime ideals in this commutative ring. And the point is, you know, every K commutative k-algebra of finite with generated by finitely many elements can sort of obviously be written in this way. <coughs> um, yeah. So. Uh, Right, so if you just have a finite group, you can imagine that as just a disjoint union of a finite collection of copies of spec K, you know, whatever one for each element in the group. Um, and that's a group scheme in an obvious way. Um, okay, uh, or uh, 
um, some positive dimensional examples, you could have, say, um, you know, GLN, the group of invertible, and by the matrices, I write the subscript K if I want to remind myself that things are defined over a particular field K, um, so the group of n by n invertible matrices, or various interesting subgroups of that, like, say, SLN matrices with determinant one, or the orthogonal group. Um, really, <laughs> I should talk about the orthogonal group of a particular quadratic form, but maybe I'll indicate that in the notation. The symplectic group, um, matrices that preserve a, an alternating bilinear form, um, et cetera, you know, G2 or the exceptional Lie groups, um, and, uh, and let's see, and some basic examples are the multiplicative group, um, which as an algebraic variety is just um, um, the group of, you know, the affine line, the <laughs> one-dimensional vector space minus the origin, so to say, or say the additive group, um, which is just um, the additive line. Um, okay, I mean, I'm sorry, I hope the re reason for the name is obvious. I mean, I mean, the additive group where the group operation is addition and the multiplicative group where the group operation is multiplication. Um, okay, so these are some sort of, uh, I mean, these are rather typical examples of affine group schemes. Um, okay, uh, so. Okay, and then quickly, like, so what, what are classifying spaces? I mean, um, in topology, you know, G, print, G bundles, the, the set of isomorphism classes of G bundles over a topological space is, descri is equivalent to homotopy classes of maps from any given space into a certain universal space called the classifying space. Um, and a way to define that in topology is to say, um, you know, for G, a topological group, um, so for example, it could be a discrete group. Um, the, the classifying space BG is defined as you take any contractible uh, space, um, maybe called EG traditionally, divided by um, a free uh, G action. Okay. okay, and sort of that's it. Um, the sort of remarkable thing is that uh, it doesn't matter which contractible space you choose or which or how G is acting on it, as long as the action is free, um, the homotopy type of this quotient space doesn't depend on any choices. Um, so, um, well defined, I mean, um, maybe I should say up to say weak homotopy equivalence, I will just say homotopy equivalence. Um, okay. Um, right, and um, Let's see. So for example, when, when you talk about, uh, if you've heard about group cohomology for discrete group, group cohomology just, you know, let's see, that is the cohomology of this space. Um, so for a discrete group G, I guess another word for that would be um, that it's, it's a KG1 space, right? It's, uh, if you take a contractible space divided by a free action of a discrete group, then the, the um, you know, the fundamental group of that quotient is G, um, and the higher homotopy groups are just the same as the universal cover, which is uh, zero. Um, so, so for a discrete group, this is a so-called KG1 space, and, and sort of the definition of the cohomology of a group, say, with integer coefficients, um, is just the cohomology of this space. Um, so <laughs> this, uh, you know, somehow, I mean, this, this, uh, notate, this uh, equation can look a little weird, but I mean, that's, that's the way it goes. Um, okay, so, um, right, so for example, um, maybe another example would be the classifying space of the circle group. Another simple example is, um, well, you need to cook up some uh, space that the circle, uh, contractible space rather, that the circle acts freely on, and the standard choice is, I could say R infinity, but let me say C infinity minus the origin divided by the circle group. Um, this is homotopy equivalent to when we write it as C infinity minus the origin divided by C star, the non-zero complex numbers, and that's um, CP infinity. Okay, so, um, yeah, so I mean, like, what one thing you get out from the fact that this, this thing is independent of choices is like, okay, in, in this case, this, this space is infinite dimensional, um, but, you know, actually every classifying space for the circle has to be infinite dimensional because you look at the cohomology of this space and it's, you know, it's obviously, uh, non-zero and infinitely many degrees, right? It's a polynomial ring in one generator of degree two. Um, and so any other classifying space for the circle has to have that same cohomology. Um, and therefore, you know, just because these are infinitely many of these groups are non-zero, it has to be infinite dimensional. So, so you could read off, therefore, that um, 
any finite dimensional contractible space that the circle acts on, uh, well, it can't act freely, either, you know? Um, yeah. I guess with a little more work, you could show that there have to be, um, there had to be some fixed points. <laughs> okay. Uh, right. So that's that. Uh, okay. Now what to do? Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So then I just wanted to sort of briefly say what, um, how do you make an analog of the classifying space in algebraic geometry, and then um, don't do any more with that definition until next lectures. Uh, anybody <laughs> want to try to ask a question? Not easy, I realize. It's a big group. Okay. Let's see. Okay. That's okay. So, um, okay. So, what to do? Um, to um, say in, in motivic homotopy theory. Or, um, so the idea is, you know, if you're given, um, by the way, I'm being a little bit more special about the sort of groups I'm considering than, than in topology. In topology, you can take any topological group here and have these assumptions, affine group scheme of finite type over a field. But anyway, in that situation, what should be the, you know, the motivic homotopy type BG? So, you know, you want to imitate this definition, um, but uh, typically, as I, we've already seen in topology, there's no way you could choose this contractible space to be finite dimensional. And so, you know, if you wanted to have a free G action, typically. Um, so, so there's no way to choose this to be a single algebraic variety. Algebraic varieties, by normal de <laughs> typical definitions, are finite dimensional. Um, and so the idea is to approximate that by finite dimensional uh, things. So, just to plunge into the definition, you say, um, so let V be, so, you know, given G as above, an affine group scheme of finite type over field, um, K, um, you just look at representations of G as an algebraic group. Um, v, G, these are vector, finite, let's say finite dimensional vector spaces over K with an, you know, algebraic action of the group G. Um, and then there's always going to be a closed subset. Could be the whole space, but um, could be smaller. If there's a closed subset, S inside V. So, so this is sort of a <laughs> crucial point of the definition. So, so representations you could think of as a purely linear algebraic object. But um, a vector, finite dimensional vector space I can also view as a scheme over K. It's, it's just affine space of some dimension over K. And from that point of view, I can talk about closed subsets of it, not just um, you know, linear subspaces. Uh, so, so closed here means defined by polynomial equations, not just by linear equations, as you might consider in, in representation theory. Um, there's a closed subset such that um, G uh, acts freely on V minus S. Um, you know, you can make a reasonable definition of acting freely for an algebraic group. And um, let's see, uh, right, and then the idea is to just, um, Let's see, I'm going to say this. So moreover, you can, if you look at different representations of the group, you can find representations such that the co-dimension of the subset is as big as you want. Um, so, you know, by varying V, we can make um, the co-dimension of S inside V uh, go to infinity, to put it vaguely. In other words, you can make an infinite list of representations such that these, these subsets have higher and higher co-dimension. That's sort of very easy to arrange um, maybe, okay, so there's a basic algebraic fact that the kind of group I'm considering, it has a faithful finite dimensional representation. Um, and once you have one faithful representation, you can just take, for example, direct sums of more and more copies of that representation. And then it's very easy to, to just check that um, that sequence of representations, that, you know, the group acts mostly freely on them in the subset where it doesn't act freely, gets higher and higher co-dimension. <coughs> um, and so, yeah, so then the definition, <laughs> to put it slightly vaguely, is that the classifying space of an algebraic group in motivic homotopy theory um, over the field, K, um, maybe like H of K, the category of uh, spaces over K, so to speak, you just define it to be the co-limit of um, these quotient varieties, uh, V minus S mod G, where um, uh, 
the, the code element is running over sequences of representations such that um, the code dimension of S inside V is going to infinity. Um, so this is a sort of slightly uh, vague way of putting it because um, you, you know, in order to talk about the code element, you have to have some maps. And so, so you know, imagine like including one representation into the direct sum of that with some other representation. Um, anyway, with a little care, you can get a sequence of maps. And um, this is the definition and the sort of, you know, as in topology, the sort of striking thing is that um, this is well-defined, um, you know, up to A1 homotopy equivalence. It doesn't matter, like, which representations you choose. So, so for example, you could take, as I said, any faithful representation, look at direct sums of that representation, um, and then this co-limit would be the same no matter which representation you chose. <coughs> Okay, so like one thing to realize about that is that, um, how can I say, this is sort of completely compatible with the topological definition in the sense that for, um, if my base field is a complex numbers, then if I take this algebraic, uh, this motivic homotopy type, one thing you can do with a motivic homotopy type over, for, if it's over the complex numbers, you can take its topological realization, which corresponds to like, if it's an algebraic variety, you just take the set of complex points with the classical um, Hausdorff topology instead of the, the Zariski topology. So in this case, the topological realization of that thing just is the usual <laughs> topological classifying space of, say, the, the, the topological group of um, complex points of G. So I'm sort of using this notation where um, a scheme is this <laughs> sort of weird topological space in the discrete topology. Um, but you know, you could just take the, the set of solutions of the equations with the, comp, you know, the complex numbers, use the classical topology instead of this, the Zariski topology, and then we're sort of in a normal topological situation. Um, right, and I want to say this is obvious because um, the point is, what are we doing here? We're taking um, you know, a particular sequence of spaces uh, on which G acts freely and taking the quotient. Now these spaces are not contractible, but you know, when you're making this co-dimension go to infinity, you're, you're making these, these quotients closer and closer to being contractible, and so, so to speak, in the limit, this is just a contractible space divided by G. That's a lazy, but I mean, but this is true. <clears throat> um, right, so for example, um, you know, if, if we're over the complex numbers, then you could just talk about the, you could, could study the ordinary cohomology of this um, motivic homotopy type, and you would just be talking about the usual um, cohomology of a topological classifying space. Um, there's no difference. Um, but sort of, you know, the, the interesting novelty is that there are invariants of algebraic varieties that are not purely topological, um, such as uh, the Chow groups, and, um, you know, and so we get a sort of uh, a new invariant of, of algebraic groups, G. Um, for, you know, for, we had various invariants, whatever invariant you want to look at, but for example, um, the Chow ring of the classifying space of a group, say over the complex numbers, it's some naturally defined ring that maps to the ordinary cohomology of BG, um, um, but this map is not always an isomorphism. Um, so, uh, right, so the idea is like, this is some sort of new, in some sense, right, we, the idea is like, oh, I didn't really say this, but, the Chow ring, as we'll see, is cooked up from algebraic subvarieties. So it's like saying that, in general, like not all the cohomology of, of the classifying space of a, of a, say, a GLN or, or G2. I mean, let's say not not all the cohomology of, of an algebraic group in general comes from algebraic subvarieties of the classifying space, which in the past you couldn't even talk about, but now we have a reasonable um, definition of. In other words, uh, concretely, that's saying that for these quotient varieties, I mean, basically. The problem of understanding this is the same thing as understanding the child groups of these quotient varieties. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's what I'll hope to describe in this course. Like, how can you do some calculations? Okay. Uh, right, so for the rest of today, I just sort of want to review like what, or <laughs> to describe what child groups are and, and especially what properties they have. <clears throat> Uh, question or? Okay. All right. So uh, let's see. So child groups. Um, 
the, uh, yeah, maybe a tiny bit of history. So these were introduced by Severi in the 1930s um, uh, and studied by Wei Liang Chao in the 1950s um, and studied by many other people since then. Um, so uh, <clears throat> let's see. So quickly, these are, as I say, the, the, the quick definition is it's a version of uh, homology um, where you only use algebraic subvarieties. So specifically um, for, but let's say this, the sort of uh, schemes that I want to consider are uh, let's, like this. So let's see, let X be a separated scheme of finite type over field. Um, uh, Is it working? Okay, can this be, yeah, uh, okay, sorry. Um, no, hello, hello, yes. Sorry. Um, so for example, this could be um, a quasi-projective um, scheme over K, which is maybe the, the case to think about. Um, in other words, like projective space uh, is a basic example of an algebraic variety um, over a given field, and um, a projective scheme means a closed subscheme of that, so a subspace defined by some, in that case, homogeneous polynomial equations, and quasi means an open subset of a closed uh, subset. So it's like one algebraic subset minus a possibly lower dimensional algebraic subset. Um, okay, uh, so let's see. Then in this situation, um, oh, let's see, and also I'll define a variety um, over K to mean um, an integral scheme, which is to say reduced and irreducible. So like, um, you know, any algebraic, uh, uh, set defined by polynomial equations, it only has a finite number of um, irreducible components, and uh, a variety means just sort of one of these components. It's sort of, basically there's all these nice finiteness properties in algebraic geometry that you wouldn't have in topology. Like it, Rn has all kinds of horrible closed subsets in the usual topology, but any closed subset of, for example, projective space has only a finite number of um, irreducible pieces. Um, okay, uh, right, so let's see. So an algebraic cycle, um, let's see, let's see. The abelian group um, of, of I-dimensional algebraic cycles Back again, yeah. But, uh, 
Maybe it's a better. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. So, um, what sort of relations uh, do I I want? So, like, yeah, if you're trying to imitate homology, I want to say that a, a subvariety gives me a homology class, and then what sort of relations do I want among subvarieties? Um, basically, what I want to say is that sort of um, homology <laughs> or invariants like that in topology are sort of vaguely based on the unit interval, right? You, you want to say that if you move continuously from zero to one in sort of any family of things, those things should sort of count as being equivalent. And the idea in algebraic geometry is to um, replace the interval by the affine line or maybe the projective line. Um, so we just sort of want to declare that if I have, um, say, a variety with a map to P1, um, so let's say that uh, F is a rational function. This is the field of rational functions on X. Um, rational function, I could say, <laughs> is a, a regular function, a, a sort of polynomial function defined on some non-empty open subset of X. Um, so anyway, um, uh, let's see. So then I, I sort of want to declare that the inverse image of zero um, should be equivalent to the inverse image of infinity. So this is like zero infinity to two particular points in P1. Um, the basic idea of child groups is I want to declare that, um, you know, the inverse image, given any map like this, the inverse image of zero should count as being equivalent to the inverse image of infinity. Um, in that picture, it looks a little bit like a picture of cobordism. I mean, that's, all, that's another analogy. <coughs> um, okay, so let's see how to say this. So definition, um, so for, um, let's say, a variety uh, x over field and a rational function on there, <coughs> um, you can define its order vanishing um, on any uh, co-dimension one subvariety. Um, so for D, um, an irreducible divisor on X, um, which just means um, co-dimension one subvariety. Uh, yeah, okay, so, um, and let's see, so the idea is this, this uh, thing is the, it's called the order vanishing uh, of my rational function on this co-dimension one subvariety. I think for reasons of time, I'm not gonna uh, go into any detail, but yeah, like um, say, say this is one of my co-dimension one subvarieties. Well, it's a different picture. Um, um, right, so the idea is that a rational function on X, it might sort of vanish identically on D or it might have a pole and I want to declare this number to be, you know, positive if there's a zero along everywhere along D you know, negative if there's a pole everywhere along D and there's a way to keep track of the, you know, the order of the zero or pole. Um, maybe I just won't go into any detail. Um, and let's see, define. Um Piece of tape. Oh. I mean, I think, yeah, I'm not sure about taping because we got to get over yeah. sometimes. Maybe I'll just clip it on. I was just going to, the batteries might be low as well. Mm -hmm. Because people did use it all. Mm -hmm. Let's just replace the batteries. If it's red, that means the batteries are low. Which Yeah, yeah. Try, oh, yep. And try to clip it. Yeah. Because okay. the more you move it, it can. I see. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay, <laughs> sorry. So the divisor of a rational function is um, the sum over all um, co dimension one subvarieties um, in my variety of um, the order of vanishing um, of f along that divisor times d, which lives in, the, in this. Uh, um, the group of cycles of dimension n minus one, where n is the dimension of x. 
Um, right. So in other words, yeah. So a given rational function, it's only going to have zeros or poles at a finite number of um, codimension one subvarieties. So this is a finite sum, um, which is the kind of thing allowed in this group. Um, okay. And yeah. So basically, that's uh, <laughs> definition of Chow groups. I'll get to this. One second. Um, Sorry, would you mind saying again what was or D of F? I tried to describe it uh, without writing down the definition. So it's, it's the order of vanishing of the function along that divisor. So a function, so yeah, a function will vanish on co-dimension one subsets in algebraic geometry. So if it vanishes along this whole divisor, this number is going to be positive, and there's a notion of vanishing to order one, order two, et cetera, like, like the function x squared <laughs> vanishes to order two at the origin or things like that. Is that okay? Or if it's like the function one over x has order vanishing, you know, minus one at the origin. One over x cubed has order vanishing minus three at the origin. That makes sense. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Uh, right. Okay. Okay. So then, quickly, um, definition of Chow groups. Um, so the i Chow group um, of um, of a scheme x under the assumptions that I had. So it's maybe separated the finite type over a field. Um, so what do you do? You take, uh, first of all, this group of i-dimensional cycles, that's to say the free abelian group on the set of, code of sorry, i-dimensional subvarieties of x divided by, uh, well, a bit of a mouthful, the sum over all um, uh, i plus one-dimensional subvarieties um, w and x um, and over all um, not identically zero rational functions on that subvariety um, of, um, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, I could say over the group, group generated by, um, for you take all possible co-dimension, sorry, I plus one dimensional subvarieties, all rational functions on those subvarieties, and um, you look at the divisor of F. Now, what sort of thing is that? That's a sum of, with integer coefficients of co-dimension one subvarieties of W, but a co-dimension one subvariety of W has dimension I, right? Because W has this dimension. Um, so, so these uh, things, these expressions, live in here. They're I-dimensional subvarieties of X. Okay. So, uh, let's see. <laughs> if I hope the picture sort of makes sense. So you have like, you have maybe, for example, take I equals zero. What is an element in the zeroth Chow group of X? Well, it's a, um, it's represent any given element in, um, in the zero in the Chow group of zero cycles is generated by some finite sum of uh, closed points, maybe with some coefficients like three minus five, four, because this is the free abelian group on the set of actual subvarieties. Um, and then what relations do you have? Well, according to this definition, you're supposed to look at like all possible curves in the variety, like in this case, one dimensional subvarieties, and all possible functions on that curve, um, like f from there, a rational function I can think of as a map to P1. Um, and then this, I'm declaring that certain zero cycles on that curve count as zero. What are they? Well, this, um, this expression is exactly what I tried to draw in this picture. It's because um, I sort of look at like, where the function is zero, and I count that with a positive sign. Uh, where the function is infinity, I count that with a negative sign, and I count that whole expression as being zero. So like, for example, if this curve is just isomorphic to P1, and this map was an isomorphism, I'd be declaring that like, this point is equal to that point. Um, but you know, I'm considering all different rational functions and all different curves. <coughs> okay, um, right. So in some sense, like, this is like the narrowest possible, you know, if you're sort of trying to imitate homology in, in algebraic geometry, this is like the, the smallest possible set of generators you could use and the smallest possible set of relations. Um, in other words, it's like the most, most sort of algebraic uh, as opposed to topological definition you could make. <coughs> So maybe some context is um, that this fits into the more general notion of motivic uh, cohomology um, or homology. Um, so let me first say, like, if um, x is smooth um, over k of dimension n everywhere, um, then we also write um, Chow upper i x um, to mean the Chow group of um, cycles of dimension n minus i. So basically, the, the subscript notation represents the, the, the number represents the dimension of these cycles that we're interested in. 
And here I'm numbering cycles by co-dimension. Um, but it's just a convention that you know, I only use that notation if x is actually uh, smooth. OK. Um, right, so what to do? Uh, yeah, let's see. OK. Um, OK, so let me, uh, what to do? OK, so, so for example, yeah, so to, to compare these things to uh, ordinary homology, we could say, um, so if the k is, k is the complex numbers, um, there's a natural um, cycle map um, where it goes from child groups to um, naturally uh, borel moore homology, as I mentioned, 2i uh, of x. So this is um, borel moore homology, or what Bob and book calls homology with closed support. Um, let me try to describe uh, what that is quickly. So, so the idea is that, in case you haven't seen that, so, so if um, x is proper over C, which means that um, the associated space in the classical topology is compact. So for example, like projective space is proper, affine space uh, positive dimension is not proper. Um, so in that case, um, you know, so let's say, so that's equivalent actually to X of C being compact. Um, in that situation, borel moore homology is just the same thing as ordinary homology. Um, so this is a kind of, borel moore homology is a sort of variant of homology. It's the same thing if you're talking about compact, reasonable compact spaces. Um, and you know, what is, this, uh, <clears throat> what is this map? I mean, I wanna say it's the obvious thing. So <laughs> let's see. So if I'm given an I-dimensional subvariety, whoa. <laughs> um, you know, let, let's say this is proper. So, uh, oh, sorry. I mean, I'm just gonna use this for a minute. I wouldn't, yeah, thanks. Thanks. Right. So, so yeah, so for example, like, if this subvariety were actually smooth, um, then Poincare duality tells me that I have a fundamental class uh, in the second, in the, in the sort of top, uh, yeah, 2i homology of z with i coefficients, um, and, and that, of course, maps to the 2i homology of the whole space. So basically, I wanna say that's what, that's a typical example of what this cycle map is. Um, so, you know, you, if, if Z is not smooth, you know, you could still talk about, there is still a notion of the fundamental homology class of Z, you know, basically because this, this subset on which the space is singular, it has complex codimension at least one, so real codimension at least two. So basically, as far as homology grows, uh, like any algebraic subvariety kind of looks like a smooth manifold. At least it, ha it still has a fundamental class in homology. And, um, and again, like that's, that's what this map is doing. You have to check that if two cycles are rationally equivalent, that's this uh, relation here, then they are homologous, but that's quite easy, I think. <coughs> oh yeah, sorry, so this is, um, why do I have this <coughs> borel moore homology in general instead of ordinary homology? Well, um, the, the point is that if, if X is a non-compact algebraic variety, um, like affine space or something, then if I have, um, an element in the child groups that's represented by some closed subvariety of that, um, but this will also typically be a non-compact variety, right? A closed subset of something that's non-compact. There's no, I mean, it might be compact, but usually not. Um, so, um, right, and so a non-compact, even if this were smooth, a non-compact manifold usually does not have a fundamental class in ordinary homology, right? The ordinary homology of a non-compact manifold is sort of zero in the top degree, um, so there's sort of nothing there. Um, but in borel moore homology, even a non-compact manifold, or even a non-compact algebraic variety, um, has a fundamental class. Um, let me try to say, yeah. So in, in short, <laughs> not to drag everything out, um, what is borel moore homology? It's, it's a homology of uh, a possibly non-compact space modulo or relative to um, infinity. So basically, like, if you, have, um, if you have some compact space and you remove a closed subset, then the uh, borel moore homology of that is the relative homology of uh, x comma z. Um, and so, yes. So for example, like the, the borel moore homology of Rn is the same thing as the ordinary homology of the sphere relative to the point of infinity. And so like in that example, there is, Rn has a an n-dimensional class in borel moore homology, but not in ordinary homology. <coughs> And so, but yeah, so basically just because algebraic subvarieties of something non-compact are themselves non-compact, that's why you map to 
you get a map to Burrell Moore homology, not to ordinary homology. Okay. Um, so in case that seems Burrell Moore homology is totally unfamiliar, I could point out that for, for smooth varieties, that's totally familiar. <coughs> So uh, let's see, yeah, so for, I could talk about oriented non-compact manifolds, but let's just say for uh, smooth, possibly non-compact algebraic varieties, um, you know, Poincare duality, it has a version for non-compact manifolds, but to express that you have to say it in terms of uh, real more homology, not, um, uh, not ordinary homology. So yeah, the i homology of x is the same thing as h, sub uh, whatever, 2n minus i for L more of x. Um, right, so this is like saying, you know, what is a, what, how do you typically represent a cohomology class on a non-compact manifold? Like what's an element of h upper i, where I guess n, n here is the complex dimension of x. So 2n is the, is the real dimension of x. Um, like, yeah, so geometrically, what's a typical way to write down a cohomology class on a manifold? Well, an element of H upper I typically is represented by writing down an, a co-dimension I, maybe oriented submanifold. But if you're on a non-compact manifold, uh, the submanifolds that represent these elements in this group are typically non-compact, and so they live in, in borel moore homology, not in ordinary homology. Uh, yeah, so we could say that, so for X smooth over C, um, we have, I can sort of rewrite the cycle map um, in this co-dimension notation, it says that a co-dimension i algebraic subvariety determines uh, a two i degree uh, cohomology class. You know, because because it is a, a sort of, I mean, except for singularities, it's a co-dimension, the complex co-dimension i subspace. That's the typical kind of thing that represents uh, a cohomology class. <laughs> okay. Um, right. What else to do? Um, okay. So let's, let me mention briefly some. That has to be very quick, some sort of formal properties um, of Chow groups. Um, so if um, x to y is a proper morphism, so in topology, a proper morphism means a, a proper map, means a continuous map such that the inverse image of compact sets is compact. Um, over C, there's a way to make that an algebraic definition, and the algebraic definition makes sense over any field. Um, so we get a group homomorphism from the child groups, maybe called F lower star, proper push forward from child groups of X to child groups of Y. Ah, so maybe I should do like uh, one or two example calculations, sorry. Um, so for example, um, let's see. So let's say a good example would be the child groups of projective space over any field. Um, this is equal to um, slice more to Z if, um, I is a number between zero and one up to n, and zero otherwise. Um, and uh, yeah, it's sort of important to understand like what is, what is the generator of this group geometrically, um, and hopefully it's the obvious thing. Uh, it's it's a, a linear space. <laughs> so. Uh, so in some sense, like this is the answer to what the child groups of projective space are, but you know, elements of child groups, they also have a sort of geometric meaning. Uh, right. Generator, sorry, of um, child i of pn um, of the field is any choice of a, um, you've lost. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, is any i-dimensional, um, linear subspace, so um, a linear subspace, a projective space just means one defined by a collection of linear equations, um, so it'll be just isomorphic to pi inside pn. Okay. Um, right, uh, okay. So for example, yeah, okay. Um, what else to say, okay, so. Oh yeah, so for example, um, another quick example would be, um, Maybe I should sort of, yes, <laughs> write down a like, quick computational tool. Um, things have to be moving faster. So uh, it's a theorem that um, for uh, a scheme 
x over my field and a closed subscheme um, z, let's say, um, in x, um, we have an exact sequence um, called the localization sequence. Um, excuse me. Um, so the child groups of z map to the child groups of x, this bigger space. Um, and uh, let's see. And in some sense, the difference between the child groups of this closed subset and the child groups of the whole space are the child groups of the open complement. OK. And then comes uh, 0. So mm, this uh, 0 at the end here, this is sort of like uh, notably different from anything that happens in topology. So maybe I should, yeah, let's compare this with what happens over C with, with Burrell Moore homology. Uh, let's see. Let's, so I want to say that basically this is a rather, sorry, rather easy thing to prove um, because, you know, like, <laughs> what are we saying here? So, um, so, so yeah, we're just taking sort of subvarieties at x, and if you sort of kill off all the subvarieties that are contained in z, um, <laughs> well, it looks like sort of what you're left with are the subvarieties in, in x minus z. Um, there's a little more to the proof, but not, not a lot more. Um, maybe, you know, the most interesting fact about the sequence is, is the exactness on the right, um, which is to say that, you know, every uh, element in the child groups of, of this open complement um, can be uh, kind of extended not uniquely to a subvariety of x. So that's a sort of basically a purely geometric fact that if I have any um, algebraic subvariety of this open complement, um, then you can always take the closure of that subvariety and you will get a subvariety of x. So basically this is sort of a, a, a typical difference um, between topology and algebraic geometry. You know, if I have uh, in, in Euclidean space, if I don't know, if I remove some, some submanifold, um, and I have some, some uh, you know, closed submanifold of the complement, this submanifold could behave incredibly badly uh, along the subset that we've removed. And if you try to take the closure of this, it just won't be represented by a homology class at all. Sorry for my meaningless picture. Um, but uh, yeah, so sort of in topology, uh, let's see. So, so if the base field is the complex numbers, we have a sort of similar exact sequence, like um, from, say, Borel Moore homology of a closed subset to Borel Moore homology of the whole space, and then Borel Moore homology of the open complement. Um, so, this is because for Borel Moore homology, you have a push forward map for proper maps, just like in child groups. You can restrict the Borel Moore homology class to an open subset, uh, which again is like child groups. Um, but then the sort of strange thing is that, I mean, the, the difference is that um, there's, a, there's a next term in the sequence. There's h j minus 1 of z and so on. Um, right, so, you know, and, and it's clear that like topology, like this map is sort of typically not trajective. If I take like Rn and I remove some very complicated subspace z with a lot of homology, then this complement will typically have a lot of homology too. Um, but in child groups, um, not so. Um, yeah, okay. So maybe like this, this zero here is already sort of like a notable difference between child groups and ordinary homology. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah, so for example, I wanted to say, like what are the child groups of affine space or let's say the affine line? Okay, so the child groups of the affine uh, line over field are, um, I claim Z, if j, e sorry, let's make this a subscript, um, if j equals one and zero otherwise. Um, because, like, what is the, um, the affine line? It's, um, so proof, the affine line um, over field is, is p1 minus a particular point, call it infinity, um, and then you just use this exact sequence. So um, the, the one-dimensional child group of uh, a1 will be the same, yeah, z, z is this point, x is p1, this map is going to be an isomorphism if i equals 1 because chow sub 1 of a point is just 0. There's no one-dimensional subvarieties uh, of a point. Um, but um, in dimension 0, the 0th child group of, G, of p1 is represented by uh, a point, which I might as well take to be this particular point. So, so this map is um, an isomorphism for i equals 0, and so that gives you this, um, 
yeah, the fact that the child group of zero cycles on the affine line is zero. So geometrically, the way we think of that is, you know, if you're given a point on the affine line, you can kind of move it off to infinity, you know, using a rational function. And so basically, a, every point on the affine line is equivalent to zero. Um, but a sort of on P1, you can't do that. <laughs> you can sort of move, you can make any two points equivalent to each other, but you can't make a given point equal to zero on P1. Sorry? Did I say it wrong? Uh, no, this is right. So because, so there, so like there is a one-dimensional subvariety of the affine line, and that's not rationally equivalent to zero because to make it rationally equivalent to zero, <laughs> you'd have to have a function on some two-dimensional subvariety of a one, and there is no such thing. So yeah. So th with a subscript j, you know, chow, let me write that down. So chow sub one of a one is z, but the chow group of zero cycles on a one is zero. Um, Uh, uh, yeah, 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 definitely. Um, so yeah, so that has to do with uh, maybe a good thing to mention that the relation between Chow groups and motivic homology or homology in general. Um, yeah. So let's see. Right. So um, yeah. So in some sense, the the natural analog of ordinary cohomology in, in, uh, in motivic homotopy theory is um, motivic cohomology, which is a bi-graded theory. Um, so, which let's, let's, for example, I could consider this for um, a scheme X, a finite type over field. I mean, um, yeah, so for a scheme of finite type over field, there, there's an interesting sort of bi-graded cohomology theory um, which in some sense, so these groups all together are the right generalization of ordinary cohomology. And what happens is that if x is um, smooth over k, then Chow groups are just a special case of this um, uh, motivic cohomology. Um, so this Chow, Chow upper i is the same thing as h upper 2i of x. Uh, motivic cohomology is coefficients at z of i. Okay. Um, and yes, if x is singular, then, then I should instead say that Chow groups numbered by dimension are the same thing as a certain Borel Moore motivic homology, but I won't um, write that down. So, so for example, uh, let's say, yeah, so for example, if, let's say that X and Z are both smooth here, so I can write this a little more neatly. Um, so say uh, Z is a smooth co-dimension R subvariety um, of X smooth over K some smooth scheme over K, um, then, uh, right, so then we have this exact sequence, which I can now write in the following way. Um, so, yeah. So here, the, the dimension of a subvariety of X is the same thing as this dimension as a subvariety of Z, but in terms of codimension, uh, you know, a codimension uh, subvariety, a given codimension subvariety of Z has bigger codimension as a subvariety of X. So the numbering goes like this, then I map to Chow upper I of the complement, uh, well, yeah, so then just goes zero, but maybe the interesting question is like what's on the right here, uh, what's on the left here? So this is, um, in terms of the motivic cohomology numbering, this is H2I minus 2R of Z comma Z of uh, R minus I. This is, um, sorry, H upper 2I of X comma Z of I. Right, and what goes here is um, cohomology, <laughs> let's hope I get the numbering right, so this should be H2I minus one of, uh, of x minus z with coefficients in z of i. So this, uh, this sort of second, this weight uh, numbering kind of stays the same as what you would expect, uh, and this numbering goes down by one, which hopefully is the same way these sequences would work in topology. Um, yeah, so, so the idea is like, I mean, motivic cohomology was defined quite late by Bloch and Vyvotsky, and um, yeah, in some sense, Child groups are the sort of special case of that, which is sort of has a neat, uh, has a simple geometric meaning, I guess I would say. Okay. Right, so in some sense, we do know <laughs> what goes beyond this sequence as I wrote it, um, but it involves more different groups than just child groups. Okay, so maybe like the, <laughs> yes, I did not get to all the things that I wanted to say, but uh, maybe like one thing is something about uh, Turing classes. 
Um, so let's see, an algebraic vector bundle um, E on a scheme X um, has churn classes. Um, Mm, you know, ith churn class, which lives in um, shall upper i of x. And essentially, hopefully, anything that you've learned about the properties of churn classes, uh, vector bundles, and topology, you know, of complex vector bundles and topology, will sort of work for these classes. So they satisfy usual sorts of um, formulas, you know, for lack of time. Um, yeah, so for example, if I have any exact sequence of vector bundles, um, then uh, you have the usual formula for the, the, uh, the total churn class of B. It's the product of the total churn classes of A and C, where this means um, 1 plus C1 of B plus C2 of B, et cetera, which is kind of living in the whole um, Chow ring in all different um, degrees. Um, so yeah, I might make the point that in topology, uh, for, for reasonable topological spaces, any exact sequence of vector bundles automatically splits because you, you can choose a Hermitian metric on B and then sort of take the orthogonal complement of A. In algebraic geometry, that's just not true. Um, there are lots of exact sequences of vector bundles that do not split, but um, nonetheless, this formula still holds, even though, yeah, just it holds for any exact sequence. Um, let's see. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I just had to say, like, sort of <laughs> in a few words, what are the uh, uh, other properties? And hopefully, uh, in, in a few minutes, uh, you can get some practice on computing. Um, so some other formal properties are, <laughs> I apologize for the yes, absurd uh, lack of time. But um, so uh, that the, if you have a smooth scheme over field, then the whole Chow ring, uh, the whole Chow groups all together, um, is a commutative graded ring. Um, and if we're over the complex numbers, then the map from the Chow ring um, to the ordinary cohomology ring is an, uh, a ring homomorphism. So, you know, to put it very briefly, um, uh, the, the inter this is called the intersection product on Chow groups, and you know, if you, I hope you have the intuition that in topology, the, the cup product um, for a manifold corresponds to um, intersecting submanifolds, and you know. That's a, that's a construction which, with a lot of care, you can make for algebraic subvarieties as well, and somehow that's why the product here agrees with the product there. Um, yeah, this is just a star, but if you want, yeah, yeah. I, I, okay, I, I see what you mean, but anyway. If I say this for one eye, then it's not a ring homomorphism anymore, but uh, yeah, not, oh, oh, sorry, <laughs> homomorphism, not isomorphism, excuse me. Um, okay. Uh, Time is up, so thank you. <laughs>